Good morning, everybody. I think I missed you yesterday for um, Autobiography of Malcolm X part. I do believe this is part 17. I'm not quite sure, but if, I, if it's not, I'll correct uh, what I wrote there. Um, once I get off and do a little research and figure out what part this is. So, we've been reading Autobiography of Malcolm X and... <clears throat> And uh, in this section, this is where the rubber meets the road. I think this, we start to approach the Malcolm X that we, um, I'm gonna wait for that to cook, finish going by. <clears throat> yeah, so I think this is the part where we start to be introduced to the Malcolm X that is more popular that we know of. Um, What else is going on? Okay. Da, da, da. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the last time we um, talked, or last time I read to you, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, West Indian Archie was after him and like basically punking him publicly and stuff like that. And, uh, he was kind of saying that the, the way he had been living his life and the things he was doing was inviting death anyway. Um, and so, yeah. Hey, Mary Kay. All right. So the last thing I read was, I'm trying to figure out, is this right for how I'm trying to read today? I don't know. All right. Well, we're just going to have it the way it was. Okay. But then I, th okay, I'll start with the last sentence so you'll know what's going on. Deep down, actually, I believe that after living as fully and as humanely as possible, one should then die violently. I, I expect it then, as I still expect today, to die at any time. But then I think I deliberately invited death in many sometimes insane ways. For instance, a merchant marine sailor who knew me and my reputation came into a bar carrying a package. He motioned me to follow him downstairs into the men's room. He unwrapped a stolen machine gun. He wanted to sell it. I said, um, how do I know it works? He loaded it with a cartridge slip and told me that all I would have to do was squeeze the trigger and release. I took the gun, I examined it, and then the first thing he knew, I had jammed it right up against his belly. And I told him I would blow him wide open. He went backwards out of the restroom and up the stairs. The way Bill Bojangles Robinson used to dance going backwards. Anybody? That must be the song, Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles. Uh, Nina Simone sings one version of it. He knew I was crazy enough to kill him. I was insane enough not to consider that he might just wait his chance to kill me. For perhaps a month, I kept the machine gun at Shorty's before... I was broken, I sold it. When Reginald came to Roxbury visiting, he was shocked at what he found out upon returning to Harlem. I spent some time with him. He was still the kid brother whom I still felt more family toward than I felt now for even our sister Ella. Ella liked, still liked me. I would go see her once in a while, but Ella had never been able to reconcile herself to the way I had changed. I was on my way into big trouble but I always had the feeling that Ella somehow admired my rebellion against the world because she, who had so much more drive and guts than most men, often felt stymied by having been born a female. <clears throat> I had been thinking only in terms of myself. Maybe I would have chosen steady gambling as a hustle. There were enough chump gamblers that hung around John Hughes's for a good gambler to make a living off of them. Chumps worked like that usually. One would have just, one would have just, do do, sorry. One would just have to never miss the games on their paydays. Besides, John Hughes had offered me a job dealing for games and I didn't want that. <clears throat> but I had come around to thinking not only of myself. I wanted to get something going that could help Shorty too. We had been talking. I felt really sorry for Shorty. The same old musician story, the so-called glamour of being a musician, 
earning just about enough money so that after he paid rent and bought his reefers and food for another routine of things, he had nothing left, plus debts. How could Shorty have anything? I spent years in Harlem and on the road and around the most popular music musicians, the names even, who really are making big money for musicians these days, and I still had nothing. <clears throat> For that matter, all the thousands of dollars I'd handled, and I had nothing. Just satisfying my cocaine habit alone cost me about $20 a day. I guess another $5 a day could have been added for reefers and plain tobacco cigarettes that I smoked. Besides getting high on drugs, I chain smoked for as many as four packs a day. Yeah, he had some money, he just spent it on drugs basically okay I'll stop the side comments and if you ask me today I'll tell you that tobacco in all forms is just as much an addiction as any narcotic and I believe that too and I would say I would add coffee people cannot even function without their coffee and the coffee folks are making billions um, and the people who grow it and pick it I'm sure are very poor all right. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. For that matter, all the, when I opened the subject of hustle with Shorty, I started by first bringing him to agree with my concept of which he was a living proof that only squares kept on believing they could ever get anything by slaving. And remember, he explained to us before that slaving was just having a job. <clears throat> And when I mentioned that I had in what I had in mind, house burglary, Shorty, who always had been relatively conservative, really surprised me by how quickly he agreed. He didn't even know anything about burglarizing. When I began to explain how it was done, Shorty wanted to bring his friend in whom I had met, and I liked him. His name was Rudy. Rudy's mother was Italian and his father was Negro. <clears throat> he was born right here in Boston. A short, light fellow, a pretty boy type. Rudy worked regularly for an unemployment for an employment agency that sent him to wait on tables at exclusive parties. He had a side gig going too, a hustle that took me right back to those old steering days in Harlem. Once a week, Rudy went to the home of this old rich Boston blue blood, pillar of society, aristocrat. The man paid Rudy to undress them both, then pick the old man up like a baby lay him on the bed, and then stand over him and sprinkle all over him talcum powder. <laughs> Rudy said the old man would actually reach his climax from having the powder over him, sprinkled over him. I told Shorty about some of the things that I'd seen back in Harlem. Rudy said that as far as he knew, Boston had no organized specialty sex houses, just individual rich, right, rich whites who had their private specialty desires catered to by Negroes, who came to their homes camouflaged as chauffeurs, maids, waiters, or some other acceptable image. Just as in New York, these were the rich, the highest society, the predominantly old men past the age of ability to conduct any kind of ordinary sex, always hunting for new ways to be sensitive. Rudy, I remember, spoke of one old white man who paid a black couple to let him watch them have intercourse on his bed. Another was so sensitive, that it's interesting that he's using the word sensitive. Um, another was so sensitive that he paid to sit on a chair outside of the room where the couple was having sex. He got his satisfaction from just imagining what was going on inside the room. All right, now y'all, maybe, yeah, there's lots of freaky stuff going on. A b good burglary team includes, I knew, what is called a finder. A finder is one who locates lucrative places to rob. Another principal need is someone to case these places. Physi their physical layouts, determine the means of entry, the best getaway routes, and so forth. Rudy qualified on both of those counts. Being sent to work in rich homes, he wouldn't be suspected when he was sized up. Mm, he wouldn't be suspected when he sized up their loot and case the joint, just running around looking busy <clears throat> with a white coat on. And I guess sometimes undressed and sprinkling powder, right? 
Rudy's reaction when he was told when he was told what we had in mind was something like man when do we start but I wasn't rushing off half cocked I had learned from some of the pros and from my own experience about how important it was to be careful and plan burglary property properly executed though it had its dangers offered the maximum chances of success <clears throat> with the minimum chance of risk if you did your job so that you never met any of your victims it first lessened your chances of having to attack or purposely kill someone and if through some slip up you were caught later by the police there was never a positive eyewitness of you it is also important to select an area of burglary and stick to that there are specific specialties among burglars some work apartments only others houses only others stores only or warehouses still others will go after only safes and strong boxes within the residence burglar category there are further specialty distinctions there are the daytime burglars the dinner and theater time burglars the nighttime burglars i think that any city's police will let you know that very rarely do they find one type who will work at a different time of day oh that's interesting uh, uh, uh. For instance, Jump Steady in Harlem was a nighttime apartment specialist. It would have been hard to persuade Jump Steady to work in the daytime if a millionaire had gone out for lunch and left his front door wide open. I had one very practical reason never to work in the daytime, aside from my inclinations. It was my high visibility. I would have been sunk in the daytime. I could just hear people. He was a reddish brown Negro over six feet tall. One glance at me and that would be enough. Setting up what I wanted to be, setting up what I wanted to be the perfect operation, I thought about pulling the white girls into it for two reasons. One was that they, <clears throat> that I realized we'd be too limited, relying only on the places where Rudy worked as a waiter. He didn't get to work in too many places. It wouldn't be very long before we ran out of sources to rob. And when other places had to be found and cased in the rich white residential areas, Negroes hanging around would stick out like sore thumbs. But these white girls could get invited in right into the places. I dislike the idea of having too many people involved at all. I'm sorry, at all. Okay, I disliked the idea of having too many people involved at all the same time but with shorty oh man how's my battery low well we'll see how far this goes but i was doing some reading last night when i was trying to get tired and there's some good stuff that happens okay do 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 where am i but with shorty and sophia's sister so close now and sophia and me as though we had been together for 50 years and rudy as eager and as cool as he was nobody would be apt to spill everybody would be under the same risk we would be like a family unit i never doubted that sophia would go along with it sophia would do anything i said and her, her sister would do anything that sophia said <clears throat> they both went for it sophia's husband was away on one of his trips to the coast when I told her and her sister about the plans. Most burglars I knew were caught, not on the job, but trying to dispose of the loot, finding the fence we used. <clears throat> so this, this word fence is, yeah, um, I guess fence, it seems like it's the job that they're gonna rob, so. I will just keep reading and figure out if that's what it is. Finding the fence we used was a rare piece of luck we agreed upon the plan for operations the fence didn't work with us directly oh i think the fence is where they like take the things that they stole and sell them the fence didn't work directly with us he had a representative an ex-con who dealt with me and no one else in my gang aside from his regular business he owned around boston several garages and small warehouses the arrangement was that before a job I would alert the representative and give him a general idea of what we expected to get. And he'd tell me at which garage or warehouse we should bring the loot. After we had made our drop, the representative would examine the stolen articles. He would remove all identifying marks from everything. Then he would call the fence, who would come and make a personal appraisal of the items. 
The next day, the representative would meet me at a prearranged place and would take the payment for what we had stolen, all in cash. Mm -mm. One thing I, I remember, this fence always sent your, okay, one thing I remember, this fence always sent your money in crisp, brand new bills. He was smart. Somehow, that had a very de definite psychological effect on all of us after we had pulled a job, walking around with that crisp green money in our pockets. He may have had other reasons. We needed a base of operations, not in Roxbury. The girls rented an apartment in Harvard Square. Unlike Negroes, these white girls could go shopping for the for the local and physical situation we wanted, for the locale and physical situation we wanted. I was on the ground floor. I'm sorry, it was on the ground floor where moving, hold on. I keep getting the low power. I mean the, so if it cuts out, then we know what happened, right? Do, do, do. It was on the ground floor and I don't know where I was. So this apartment was on the ground floor. At our gang's first meeting in the apartment, we discussed how we were going to work. The girls would get into the houses to case them by ringing bells and saying they were saleswomen or poll takers or college girls taking a survey or anything else that was suitable. Once in the houses, they would get around as much as possible without attracting attention. Then back, they would report what special valuables they'd seen and where those things were located. They would draw the layout for Shorty, Rudy, and me. We agreed that the girls would actually burglarize, burglarize in, only in special cases where there would be some advantage for them being there. But generally, the three men would go, the two of us would do the job while the third kept watch in the getaway car with the, mo with the motor running. Talking to them, laying down the plans, I had deliberately sat on the bed away from them. All of a sudden, I pulled out my gun, shook out all five bullets, and then let them see me put only one bullet back in. I twirled the cylinder, and I put the muzzle to my head. Now, I'm gonna see, now I'm gonna see how much guts all of you have, you have, I said, and I grinned at them. All of their mouths flapped open. I pulled the trigger and we all heard it click. I'm gonna do it again now. They begged me to stop and I could see Shorty and Rudy's eyes and they had some idea of rushing me. We all heard the hammer click another empty cylinder. The women were in hysterics. Rudy and Shorty were begging me, man, Red, cut it out, man, freeze, man. I pulled the trigger once more. I'm doing this to show you I'm not afraid to die. I told them, never cross a man who's not afraid to die. Now let's get to work. I never had one moment's trouble with any of them after that. Sophia acted odd. Her sister all but called me Mr. Red. Shorty and Rudy never again were quite the same with me. Neither of them mentioned it. They thought I was crazy and they were afraid of me. We pulled the first job that night, the place of the old man who hired Rudy to sprinkle talcum powder on him until he climaxed. A cleaner job could have been asked for, couldn't have been asked for. Everything went like clockwork. The fence was full of praise. We proved, he proved he meant it with his crisp new money that he gave us. The old man later told Rudy how a small army of detectives had been there. They had decided that the job had the earmarks of some, earmarks of some gang which had been operating around Boston for about a year. We, click it, we quickly got it down to a science. The girls would scout the case in a wealthy neighborhood the burglary would be pulled off. Sometimes it took more than 10 minutes. Shorty and I did most of the actual burglary and Rudy generally had the getaway car. If the people weren't home, we used a pass key on the common front door lock or, or on a patent lock. We used a jimmy, it's called, or a lock pin. Or sometimes we would enter through windows and from fire escapes or a roof. Gullible women often took the girls all over their houses just to hear them exclaiming over their finery. So do y'all invite people into your house that come to the door and be like, let me show you all my good stuff? I mean, I just, I can't imagine doing that, but I guess maybe some people do that. Um, mm -mm -mm. 
with the help of the girls' drawings and, f and finger beam searchlights, we went straight to the things we wanted and got them. It made things quick. Sometimes the victims were in their beds asleep. That may sound very daring. Actually, it was almost easy. The first thing we had to do when people were in the house was just wait very still and pick up the sounds of breathing. Snorers we loved. They made it real easy to know when they were sleeping. In stocking feet, we'd go right into the bedrooms, moving swiftly like shadows. We would lift clothes and watches and wallets and handbags and jewelry boxes. Christmas season was Santa Claus for us. People had expensive presents lying all over their houses and they had taken more cash than usual out of their banks. Sometimes working earlier than we usually did, we even worked houses that we hadn't cased. If the shades were drawn full and no lights were on and there was no answer when one of the girls rang the bell, we would take the chance and go in right then. I can give you a very good tip. If you wanna keep burglars out of your house, a light on for the burglar to see is the very best single means of protection. And I would add, get a dog and a gun. <laughs> One of the ideal things is to leave a bathroom light on all night. The bathroom is one place where somebody could be for any length of time, at any time of night, and he would just be likely to hear the slightest strange sound. The burglar, knowing this, would, wouldn't try to enter. It's also the cheapest possible protection. The kilowatts in the bathroom are a lot cheaper than your valuables. <laughs> He's a trip. We became efficient. The fence sometimes relayed tips as to where we could find good loot. And it was in this way, um, for one period, one of our best periods, I remember, we specialized in oriental rugs. I have always suspected that the fence himself sold the rugs to the people we stole from. But anyway, you wouldn't imagine the value of those things. I remember one small rug that brought us $1,000, and there's no telling what the fence got for it. Every burglar knew that the fences robbed the burglars worse than the burglars had robbed the victims. Our only close brush with the law came once when we were making our getaway. Three of us in the front seat of the car and the back seat loaded with stuff. Suddenly we saw a police car around the corner coming toward us and it went past us. They were just cruising, but then they saw in the rearview mirror that they did a U-turn and we knew we were about to, they were about to flash us to stop. They had spotted us in passing as Negroes, and they knew that Negroes had no business in this area in that hour. It was a close situation. There was a lot of robbery going on. We weren't the only gang working. We knew, not by any means, but I knew that the white man is rare who will ever consider a Negro can outsmart him. Before their light began to flash, I told Ruby to, Rudy to stop. I did what I'd done once before. I got out and I flagged the officers down, waving toward them. When they stopped, I was at their car. I asked them, bumbling my words like a confused Negro, if they could tell me how to get to Roxbury <laughs> to a certain address. They told me, and we and they went on our respective business ways. We were going along fine. We'd made a good pile and then laid low for a while, living it up. Shorty still played with his band. Rudy never missed attending his sensitive old man or the table waiting at his executive parties and the girls maintained their routine home schedules. Sometimes I still took the girls out to places where Shorty played and to other places, spending money as though it were going out of style. The girls dressed in jewelry and furs they had selected from our halls. No one knew our hustle, but it was clear that we were doing fine. And sometimes the girls would come over and we'd meet them at Shorty's in, the Rocks, in Roxby or in Harvard Square and just smoke reefers and play music. It was a shame to tell on a man. But Shorty was so obsessed with that white girl that even if the lights were low, he would pull up the shades to be able to see that white flesh by the street lamp outside. Early evenings when we were laying low between jobs, I often went to Massachusetts Avenue nightclub called Savoy. And Sophia would telephone me there punctually. Even when we pulled jobs, I would leave the club then rush back there after the job. The reason was so that if I was ever, ne if it was ever necessary, people could testify that I, they had seen me there about the same time as the job was pulled. Negroes being questioned by policemen would be very hard to pin down in any exact time, just that they had seen me. Boston at this time had two Negro detectives. Ever since I had come back on the Roxbury scene, one of the detectives, a dark brown fellow named Turner, had never been able to stand me 
and it was mutual. We talked about what he talked about what he would do to me and I promptly put an answer back on the wire about what I'd do to him. I knew from the way he began to act that he had heard it. Everyone knew that I carried guns and he did have sense enough to know that I wouldn't hesitate to use them on him, detective or not. This early evening I was in this place at the usual time. The phone in the phone booth rang. It rang just as the, as the detective Turner happened to walk through the front door. He saw me start to get up. He knew the call was for me, but he stepped inside the booth and answered it. I heard him saying, looking straight at me, hello, hello, hello. And I knew that Sophia, taking no chances with the strange voice, had just hung up. Wasn't that call for me? I asked Turner. He said that it was. I said, well, why'd you, why didn't you say so? He gave me a rude answer, and I knew he wanted to make the first move. And I knew he wanted me to make a first move. We both were being cagey. We both knew that we wanted to kill each other. Neither wanted to say the wrong thing. Turner didn't want to say anything that, re anything that repeated would make him sound like a bad cop. I didn't want to say anything that could be interpreted as a threat to a cop. But I remember exactly what I said to him anyway. Purposely, loud enough for some people at the bar to hear me, I said, you know, Turner, Turner, you're trying to make history. Don't you know that if you play with me, you certainly will go down in history because you've got to kill me. Turner looked at me. He backed down. He walked on by me. I guess he wasn't ready to make history. I had gotten to the point where I was walking on my own coffin. It's a law of the rackets that every criminal expects to get caught. He tries to stave off the inevitable for as long as he can. Drugs helped me push the thought to the back of my mind. They were the center of my life now. I had gotten to the sh um, stage where every day I used enough drugs, reefers, cocaine, or both, that I felt above any worries and any strains. If any worries did manage to push their way through the surface of my consciousness, I could float them back where they came from until tomorrow, and then until the next day. But where always before I had been able to smoke reefers and sniff snow and rarely show it very much, by now it wasn't easy. One week when we weren't working after a big haul, I was just staying high enough and I was out night clubbing. I came to this club from the I came to, into this club and from the bartender's face when he spoke. Hello, Red. I knew that something was wrong, but I didn't ask him anything. I've always had this rule. Never ask anybody. In that kind of situation, they will tell you when they want you to know. But the bartender didn't take a chance to tell me. If he had meant to, he didn't. When I sat down on the stool and ordered the drink, I saw them. Sophia and her sister sat at a table inside near the dance floor with a white man. I don't know how I ever made it such a mistake as I did. I could have talked to her later. I didn't know or care who the white fellow was. My cocaine told me to get on up. It wasn't Sophia's husband. It was his closest friend. They had served in the war together with her husband out of town. He had asked Sophia and her sister out to dinner, and they went. But then later after dinner, driving around, he had suddenly suggested going over to the Black Ghetto. It's like a field trip, huh? Let's go to the Black Ghetto. Every Negro who lives in a city has seen the type of a th that type a thousand times. The Northern Cracker who would go visit Nigger, I mean, Migger Town and be amused by the Coons. The girls, so well known in the Negro places in Roxbury, had tried to change his mind, but he insisted. So they had just held their breath and came into the club where they had been a hundred times with me. They walked in stiff-eyeing the bartenders and waiters who caught their message and acted as though, though they had never met them before. And they were sitting there with their drinks before them, praying that no Negro who knew them would barge up to their table and speak. Then I came up. I know this. I know that I called them baby. They were chalky white and he was beet red. That same night back at the Harvard Square place, I really got sick. It was less of a physical sickness, sickness than it was all the last five years catching up with me. I was in my pajamas in bed, half asleep when I heard someone knock. I knew that something was wrong. We all had keys. So this is a place where 
everybody who's in the burglary sting had keys, meaning the white girls and, and you know, Rudy and Shorty and everything. We all had keys. No one ever knocked at the door. I rolled off and under the bed. I was so groggy, it didn't cross my mind to grab from my gun on the dresser. All right, we'll stop right there. Thank you for joining me. Yep, it's going down, y'all. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Bye. Thanks for joining.